but yeah, I thank you for coming on today, man. Like, I really like, I think this is awesome. Um, this is, uh, this is an honor for me. I, th I think, I don't know if you know how much of a legend that you are or what no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you are, man. I, I, I'm here to tell you that, you know, you are a legend because I'm, well, correct me if I'm wrong. You were the first person in Canada to be issued psilocybin for therapeutic uses, right? That is true. That's from, right. from, you know, government, the government said it was okay for you to use it. First one. Yes. So, so does that mean you're the first person in the world, essentially? It might be. You know? I think so. I think it might be, unless there's somewhere <laughs> something that I don't know of, but like, um, shout out Canada <laughs> in that fact, because you guys are way ahead of the game for, you know, that, uh, that might actually be the case. Maybe I'll uh, find myself in trivial pursuit someday. <laughs> someday, <laughs> someday maybe. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, other than that, man, I, like I said, you are, you're a legend in the making and thank you for coming on. Um, I can't believe you actually wanted to come and talk to just some random guy that is on, on the internet, but yeah. <laughs> you know what? I think that, uh, you know, this, uh, whole, um, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy deal is like, so important to get out there to as many people uh, as possible because I mean you, you look around you and even if you yourself are not somebody who suffers from anxiety I guarantee you've got friends and family who do mm -hmm. and if this is something that can be as effective for other people as it has been for me then you know we really really should be looking into this. 100% man I 100% agree with you and this is what it takes it takes just people like us having a intelligent conversation you know uh, uh, just people can see that we're not these crazy you know hippies that just want to go to a rave or something we're, we're, we're regular people just like everyone else and we and the substance can help a lot of people just just, just it could be just like a regular person you don't you know it's not the 60s and 70s anymore like you don't have to be in tie-dye or you know saying mm -hmm. turn on tune in drop out like timothy leary like these things have real practical uses and in your case you know that full well on what the use is right absolutely yeah could you take me through um exactly how you came to find uh therapsil uh, is it called therapsil whatever the organization is the the uh, advocacy group advocacy group that uh, helped me with my application yes yeah so uh, could therasil. you take me therapsil so could you take me through how you came to find them your whole journey and just a sure. little bit about who you are and uh we'll get into the conversation well, you know, I, uh, I have said it before in interviews, I am about as, uh, you know, boring as white bread, generally speaking. <laughs> you know, I'm a middle-aged white guy who has had, you know, really nothing uh, weird in terms of uh, my experience with, you know, drugs of any kind prior to my uh, bout with cancer here. And uh, that has introduced me to a lot of things. Uh, medical cannabis, one, for example, and, uh, you know, uh, having anxiety at all in the first place is uh, kind of foreign to me. But uh, finding out about uh, psilocybin was kind of a roundabout thing for me. Uh, a number of years ago when I had my first round of chemotherapy, I got uh, bad neuropathy from it. So I lost the feeling in my fingers and toes. And I was doing some research on uh, Chinese medicine because there wasn't really much for Western medicine to deal with neuropathy. And uh, of course, uh, that was using a type of mushroom called lion's mane. Uh, lion's mane is, uh, you know, fairly uh, uh, popularized for its neurogenic properties. So uh, promotes the formation of new nerve cells. And, uh, you know, that I, I found was really helpful with getting the feeling back in my fingers and toes. So that was cool. But while I was searching for the mushrooms and cancer uh, as for the neuropathy, I uh, came across the Johns Hopkins studies. So, you know, uh, I, I know uh, uh, mushrooms and magic mushrooms are kind of uh, bad buzzwords for some people, but, you know, that's, uh, that's how I came across it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of filed that away and didn't, uh, didn't think about it because at the time, a couple of years ago, wasn't having anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I managed to, uh, through surgeries and chemotherapy, work my cancer to a point where they couldn't see it anymore. Oh. And uh, so, you know, I figured, you know, maybe we're uh, going to have a little bit of home free space here, but uh, 
uh, last summer, my cancer came back and uh, uh, came back after having uh, two years of completely clear PET scans. Mm. So um, at that point, I realized that my cancer is kind of invisible to all of the scans that they're using. So it doesn't show up on PET scans, doesn't show up on CT scans or MRIs. It's uh, very difficult to detect. What and kind of cancer is it? Uh, it is uh, colon cancer. Oh, okay. So uh, stage, stage four, I've got it uh, in my large intestine, small intestine, uh, lymph nodes, and peritoneal tissue. Wow. So it's a few spots. Yes, I can see. Well, you seem healthy, though. <laughs> well, you know, I, aside from the cancer, I am. Um, you know, the, the cancer and the chemotherapy tires you out uh, faster than you normally would be. But mm. um, really, aside from from the fatigue and, you know, abdominal pain and stuff like that. Um, I, I try to keep my life as normal as I can. Mm, yeah. That's, that's a good idea just to stay sane. Right. Yeah. So anyways, I found the, uh, the uh, psilocybin studies at Johns Hopkins. And once I found out that they were having like 80% success rates for a single dose for exactly what I had, seemed like a good idea if I uh, started looking around here in Canada for somebody who, could maybe supply me with a therapy or who had some familiarity with it. And uh, uh, looking for that, I came across Theracil. Uh, very fortunate that I have been able to find exactly who I need when I need to find them. I'm really incredibly lucky. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So what exactly did they, what is the actual procedure that they, um, and how, to, how did they administer yeah, yeah. Like, what, what's the procedure to get it from the government? And then what is the actual procedure for them administering the psilocybin to you? Sure thing. So um, the application process is really just a, a series of emails in, you know, the, the proper format to be talking to a government organization. So uh, Theracil had the proper people that I needed to talk to, and they had the proper formats for the emails, and uh, they had... Uh, some experience with other people who had applied. So the types of questions that the government was asking um, in terms of providing evidence of why we would want to use it, um, how it's going to be stored, where we're going to get it from, dosage, doctor recommendations, things like that. Mm -hmm. So once, you, uh, once we provided that information to them, uh, we got the approval back from the government, which essentially says that I am allowed to possess it, to transport it, to uh, use it in the presence of a uh, medical professional. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's uh, some very specific uh, safety guidelines that are associated with that to, uh, you know, it's, it's not uh, free and, and open season on taking yeah. psilocybin. Yeah, there's no magic mushroom dispensaries yet. No, no, there is not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, because there's no dispensaries, I, uh, I grew my own mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So uh, legal to get the spores here in Canada and uh, uh, for myself, legal to actually turn them into mushrooms, unlike other people. <laughs> yep. And uh, so I, I grew enough for my session and dried them and uh, ground them up and put them into capsules. So... Uh, Fortunately, the type of mushroom that I use fairly consistently goes into about quarter gram capsules. So uh, dosing is really very accurate and uh, consistent that way. Mm. So how much or, did you take in your psychotherapy session? Seven grams. Wow, that's intense. That's mm. definitely uh, life changing right there. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, Well, I uh, apparently have a bit of a tolerance for the psilocybin. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, I'm not taking it for recreational purposes. I really mm. uh, wanted to make sure that I got the most out of the experience that I was going to be able to. Mm -hmm. And did you? You know, I, I really feel like uh, I got more than what I expected. Wow. Okay, I, so, so what did you expect? And then what did you get out of it? Yeah, so what I was hoping for, and, and, and part of this whole therapeutic component of it is to have an intention 
for what you are hoping to get out of mm-hmm. your, your psilocybin session. And you discuss that with your therapist to uh, make sure that your expectations are reasonable and in line with you know, what you're likely to actually get. For mm-hmm. myself, I had three outcomes that I would have been satisfied with. Um, so a lot of people discuss uh, a feeling of connectedness to everything. Yep. So that would have been good. Um, some other people have spoken about uh, an understanding that the nature of the universe is love. Yep. Uh, that would have been uh, also good. And I have heard people say that they have an understanding that the very idea of death is ridiculous. <laughs> so That sounds accurate. Yeah. And, and so I figured if I got any of those three things, I would be you know, really happy with the results because you know, that would be... Um, for me, kind of a, a confirmation of sorts. Mm. But uh, what I actually got out of it is uh, the feeling and understanding that our universe is not the only place that we can exist even. Mm. So let alone, uh, you know, death being ridiculous, this this isn't even the only place we can be. Yeah. Um, I really... Um, I guess you could say that the really most significant thing for me is the feeling that my consciousness can exist as something other than what I identify as currently. Mm. And I am completely okay with that. Um, for me, the transition from, you know, my isolated self to being other things was a a very gentle and positive transition so in the same way you know you can uh, transition from like waking to sleep and uh, have dreams it Mm. was similar to that but but without the uh sleep in the middle i know what you mean yeah Yeah. just like a a different realm in your head Hmm. So I, I guess uh, my particular experience was uh, really uh, synesthetic. So uh, uh, sounds were uh, music that I was listening to created different realities, different universes. Yeah. And uh, once those universes were created, my consciousness became those universes. Oh, man, that is such a profound statement, isn't it? Like, how do you... How do you say that to somebody that's never experienced that before yeah it's, yeah it's a, it doesn't make sense it but I, I understand crazy. i know what you mean it sounds crazy it does but <laughs> but it's true <laughs> but it's true it, it, that it, it is synesthesia it is what happens when you take these high doses of psychedelics it's just somehow these sounds become you become morphed into them almost it's like you you fully get to engulf yourself into the sounds it's a mm-hmm. it's a crazy, crazy experience. Yeah, yeah. It uh, it wasn't just you know like uh, shapes and colors either. There, you know, these uh, spaces were uh, very defined for me in terms of you know how big they were, for example, or what was contained in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some of these spaces encompassed like maybe a single thought or a single emotion, yeah. which you know took the form of a physical thing. Mm-hmm. that was uh, in that space yeah and i recognize that of course you know my particular experience is going to be different from you know anybody else's experience and the experience itself really isn't the important part of this i, I mean you know no matter no matter who you are you're going to experience something that is out of the ordinary in one of these altered states right yes mm-hmm. but uh yeah i've been kind of working on my uh my theory of how uh, i understand things to work and um, for, for my understanding, um, our, our mind is really good at, uh, iconifying things. So, uh, mm-hmm. um, of course you're, you probably are well aware of like the default mode network and, uh, and how that works. I've heard of it. What is, do you mean? Like the default, uh, way that our brain pretty much works is, is that what it entails? Sure. So, um, in, when you're born, um, you are, you know, largely a blank slate in terms of what's coming in and how you interpret things. And uh, as you grow and experience things, 
uh, your brain forms circuits between your visual and your memory and, you know, auditory and the parts of the brain where these circuits are formed and parts that are responsible for how you uh, identify yourself, how you perceive time, mm -hmm. uh, a number of different things. Um, they're all used in a part of the brain that's called the default mode network. So mm -hmm. part of the brain that is uh, most active in people who have uh, depression, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, most commonly uh, when you're worrying and things like that. Mm -hmm. When you take a psychedelic, it physically reduces the blood flow to that particular area of the brain. Uh, so it physically puts it to sleep. So, so it's like your ego? Your ego is largely com contained in that default mode network. Mm -hmm. So once that goes to sleep, um, the guy responsible for who can talk to who uh, is no longer controlling who can talk to who. So mm -hmm. you can uh, you know, have your visual things directly connected to auditory or sound or, or you know uh, smells things like that that yep. is where your uh, hallucinations and the synesthesia comes into play mm. <clears throat> now in uh, in your mind uh, i believe that anxiety is caused when people don't have a mechanism for coping with whatever it is mm -hmm. so the first time you avoid something it makes a new circuit in your brain that uh, I kind of refer to as the the I'm out circuit right mm -hmm. so if you don't know how to deal with a problem it takes the I'm out circuit and it just kind of goes into a bucket someplace never mm -hmm. gets dealt with and as that accumulates this bucket full of stuff you haven't dealt with is what causes anxiety mm. your brain perceives this undealt with stuff as uh, danger bad whatever it happens to register that as when the default mode network goes to sleep, um, your bucket of stuff is uh, apparent as an iconified thing. So it could be a bear, could be a pack of wolves. It's just something in your head that represents uh, fear, danger, something bad. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people would experience something like this on a psilocybin trip and call that a bad trip. Now here is kind of where the therapy part of it comes in play. Um, what needs to happen is when you encounter these things that are scary, bad, uncomfortable, you need to accept them and embrace them. Mm. Very, very important yep. because the act of accepting this thing that's happening to you or embracing the danger physically forms a circuit between the bad thing and the I can handle this part of your brain. Uh, I see. Wow. So by forming this new circuit that wasn't there, mm. you now have something that says that scary thing is okay. So for somebody mm. like me, for example, you know, uh, fear of dying or, or, or something like that now has a pathway to say, I'm okay with that. Or, you know, I can accept that or it's not so bad. Something mm. like that. Yeah. When the default mode network comes back up uh, after the psychedelic wears off, that circuit is still there. And that is where the process of integration happens. So that is again, where your therapy comes back into play and we start uh, you know, discussing what you experienced and, and what that means and things like that. So the, uh, the therapy afterwards reinforces that new pathway that you just made. Mm. And the more you reinforce that, the longer lasting effects you'll get. Wow. So that is kind of my nutshell. How about that? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome theory. Uh, and it's so simple when you put it that way. It's like these things literally make the, the physical neural connection in the brain that wasn't able to connect before. It's like the psilocybin enables us to connect the dots and face our fears. And that's why there's so much power in facing our fears. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's like the, the, the psychedelics enable us to, to like, whether, whether, sometimes whether you like it or not, they allow you to face that fear. And yeah. I, I like how you set it up. You, you have to, ex, like it, you, you have to experience that, right? Like there's something that shows you that the, 
the, the idea of like what, whether you're like snakes or spiders or bears or whatever it is, whatever your fear is, yeah. isn't, isn't so bad. Yeah, so, exactly like, you, so. You, you have to draw that up in your mind and experience that, like literally, quite literally experience that. So it's interesting when you say, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, like, so it's almost like some, a lot of people have the feeling when they take these high doses that they die, like they have a feeling yep. of dying. So it's mm-hmm. like, is that what our brain does is it draws the connection into the feeling of death and we confront that and thus we're not afraid anymore? <laughs> you know, I think it is really whatever you are afraid of, whatever yeah. you are not dealing with. Because uh, a large part of the approach my particular therapist took with uh, my therapy um, was the idea that you have to kind of trust your inner healer. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind that is, you know what your problems are. Your subconscious is well aware of what you have trouble dealing with. So when you take the, uh, the psilocybin and put the default mode network to sleep, I think you take that ego that normally wants to say, you know, I'm fine, yep. <laughs> no problems, I'm okay, <laughs> takes that ego and moves it out of the way and actually deals with the thing underneath. Mm. That's so interesting, man. So what, um, what did you get out of it that was greater than to th- those first three points? So the three points were the unity of everything in life and this whole entire universe, uh, yeah. the fundamental aspect of love, and what was the third one? Uh, the concept of death being ridiculous. Yes, which are all like, if you get through those and realize those points, then I think you've, you've got what you needed out of the psilocybin experience. But what did you get that was greater than that? Uh, number four was uh, felt like a question that I had just not thought to ask. Mm-hmm. And, and that was the, the fact that this universe is not even the only thing there is. Mm-hmm. There is an infinite number of possible experiences that we can have within this universe but it's not even the only one Mm. the multiverse right yeah and and the uh by having my my consciousness feel like it expanded into these spaces it uh gave me the feeling that it's just a transition from one state to another so the transition from uh, from living to dying or not being alive is really not an ending. It's just a change. Yeah, like a metamorphosis. Yeah. You know, I, I, huh. I had uh, a lot of doubts about, you know, what that would be like. But after you actually have an experience where you can actually feel what it's like to be something else Mm. you know like before the psilocybin i just couldn't even wrap my head around the idea that you know how how would anything other than me even feel Mm -hmm. and i have to say that with the uh with the experience i had on the psilocybin um being in some of those other spaces um was uh, absorbing enough that it was, uh, you know, I- impossible for me to even think about things in this space, like family or, you know, friends or, or mm. you know, I, I was uh, aware that I still had a body and I came back to check on it every once in a while and make sure it didn't need anything, but it was uh, more of an abstract concept for me. So, you know, yeah. it wasn't really a part of me. It was just kind of something I was looking after. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, wor- I mean, words can only go so far. In, mm-hmm. And then when you're in that experience, I, I, I feel you. What, so do you think our consciousness isn't bound to our body and our brain? It's, un- it's kind of like uh, in the quantum world, I guess you could say, or it's just, it's, it's, we're just simply having this experience as a human in, in this vibration, but like, mm-hmm. but our consciousness is somewhere else and it's greater than what our body is. You know, I, uh, I was uh, action, actually watching uh, Netflix today, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, and they had uh, a phrase in there that felt pretty close to what 
this is like for me. And uh, what uh, the character in the show was, was uh, being questioned on is, who are you? And uh, what they came up with is that, uh, you know, you are the consciousness that is experiencing the sounds of and the sights of and the feelings of and hearing the thoughts of the body that is you. Mm. So you think, do you think there's a, there's a purpose to it? Like what, what are we here to do? If we are that consciousness, then why are we here in this moment, in this body? And why are we having this conversation right now? Is there, is there a reason or is it just for fun? Would you say? You know, I, I really think that, uh, it is very likely that we are supposed to be here to advance, uh, I guess you could say the cause of love or uh, maintaining uh, hmm. what is the best way to put that? I kind of see us as uh, caretakers here on the earth and I don't think we're really doing a very good job of it. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think uh, it, it is very likely that, you know, we are kind of a, uh, a multi-purpose tool here on the earth that has the ability to, really help and increase the biodiversity here yeah but uh i think we have somehow kind of gotten sidetracked on that process i we're think so. kind of working in our own interests at the moment yeah i, I see that uh, yeah human beings uh, we're servants you know like you ever heard that we are servants like we, we're here to serve but like we just have our we have our priorities right now in the wrong places it seems but mm -hmm. i know what you mean we are like we are conduits to serve the cause and the greater power of love that exists. And you realize that you fully fathom that when you're on these high doses of psilocybin, like you realize, well, I realize that at least that like love is this, it's not love as in like you see in the movies, even though that, that, that is true. And that is that, that mm -hmm. can exhibit real love, but it's like this universal force of, of just this love like when people say god is love that's what they mean it's just like this this force that we're here for like we're, we're literally here to be compassionate individuals to each other and it doesn't seem like that's what we're doing it seems like we're really off the beaten path we're getting there and it's a slow process but i know what you mean it seems like that there's no other truth like we're here to build a better world and to after that i don't know i guess we're i, I sometimes i think we're here to build a better world, to realize what we are, and to almost like build the Garden of Eden. But mm -hmm. uh, we're just kind of going through a rough patch. But you got to go through <laughs> hell to get to heaven first, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Might be kind of a, a sidetrack for you. I find uh, uh, some of the work like uh, Graham Hancock. Have you seen any yeah. of his stuff? Yeah, I love Graham Hancock. And uh, Randall Carlson is uh, another one that I really yeah. enjoy listening to. Mm -hmm. I... Uh, I was listening to those guys and I had uh, kind of a theory on some of the things that they've talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether you've uh, seen some of the stuff they had with the uh, uh, commentary impact about uh, 11, 12,000 years ago. Yeah. North America, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether you've also seen the stuff where uh, they've kind of figured out that the dirt in the Amazon basin is uh, not natural. Yeah, I've heard about that a little bit. I think I've listened to that on Joe Rogan, but I don't know too much about it. But what's your theory? Well, you know, if you, if you put a couple of those things together and you put yourself back, you know, 13,000 years, when you take a look at the amount of biodiversity that we have in the Amazon basin and the fact that it's, you know, full of man-made soil, maybe it looks like there was a purpose for why that particular area of the world has so much diversity may mm -hmm. not be an accident. Um, I think it's possible that people in that particular time period were a lot better at um, bioengineering and working with plants than I we so. currently are. Yep. Um, I believe that 13,000 years ago, there were much lower coastlines. And I think there was a civilization that really populated those areas. And was likely more in touch with nature than we are. Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, 12,500 years ago, the uh, comets strike the, the uh, ice cap that is covering most of North America. 
rapidly melts it, scours this civilization from the face of North America and drowns the rest of it when the sea levels rise. Mm -hmm. There is just a small scattering of this civilization that is left, but the people who are left are no longer doing this um, looking after of the earth. They're just trying to survive. Yeah. That's us. We, yeah. we are just the, uh, the scrappy survivors from this massive cataclysm mm. that wiped out um, all of these years of knowledge of plants and interaction with nature. Mm. Yeah, I, that's, that's your own theory? That's my theory. Uh, with, with Graham Hancock's? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I do kind of believe that. I, I do feel like we're, uh, we lost part of ourselves. Like there is, uh, Terrence McKenna says, we're living through the archaic revival. And this <laughs> is the, like, this is, you know, we lost parts of our humanity, I guess you could say. And I, yeah. I do believe that. Um, I don't know if it was then, like, you know, like it could have been, I don't know too much about the subject, but there is something we've lost and it is, it's, it's being in touch with nature in mm -hmm. the, the world. And, you know, it's not an accident that these psilocybin mushrooms are, they are literally nature. Isn't that, isn't that one of the most amazing thing, things mm -hmm. is that the, this, um, the experience that you had on seven grams of mushrooms, it wasn't synthesized in a lab. Uh, it wasn't like, it, 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 it wasn't man-made. It was literally, I mean, you grew them, but it wasn't, it wasn't like you, somebody actually went through the whole process of making them. It's like, yep. I did not create the mushrooms. The mushrooms came from the earth. It's, it's craziness. It's, it's, and all you did was eat them. And it seems like they're chemical messengers and we've lost touch with those mm -hmm. chemical messengers. And in the Amazon, one of the biggest chemical messengers there is, is ayahuasca. Yeah. which is like, I've never done that before, but I've um, read many accounts of what that experience is like. And it just goes to show that, like, you know, sometimes we may need that and mm -hmm. we've lost touch with that. And psilocybin is in the same vein as ayahuasca. It's <laughs> like, we need to get back to our roots and get yeah. back to what nature is telling us or else we're going to kill this world. So what are your uh, thoughts on, uh, I I've been kind of thinking about the fact that we have, so psilocybin, uh, mm -hmm. LSD, uh, dimethyltryptyline, ayahuasca, uh, peyote. We've got um, holotropic breathing, uh, yep. rhythmic drums and chanting, uh, some pain rituals that they used to do in some ceremonials. All of these different techniques all get you into an altered state of consciousness yeah. where you seem to be able to connect, connect with uh, you know, this state. It seems to me that maybe we are supposed to go there. Maybe we are in our lifetimes supposed to experience whatever this is because why else would it be so easy and common to get there? Yeah, I 100% agree. And it's unfortunate that some people won't experience that in their lifetime um and i think so especially when you're when you have that experience whether it, you know whether it's doing yoga or you're on some kind of mm -hmm. substance or some kind of holotropic breathing and especially yeah. when when you have that feeling and you're in that state of mind you feel like it this is the, like this is purposeful like you feel like this isn't an accident like there mm -hmm. is this like it's just like yeah of course this is like how it's supposed to be like it, it just almost feels like a sense of like being home it's like yeah. a state of mind that just seems to be uh, more real than than real, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But I, it's not, found... I, don't th I don't think we're meant to be there um, forever in this life. It's meant to be like we're, we're, we visit there and mm -hmm. then we come back with the lessons and then we come back to this realm. Yeah. This realm seems like the place where we have experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them are uh, good. Some of them are bad. Um, you know, I'm... I'm not really convinced that there, there is really any such thing as uh, good and bad necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of the way that we interpret stuff. Um, you know, I, that uh, story about, uh, you know, uh, the sinking of the Titanic was a terrible tragedy for all of the passengers, but mm -hmm. for the lobsters in the kitchen, it was a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all perspective. Yeah. It's all perspective, mindset. You know? So, you know, I, I, I have stage four cancer, right? It is 
terminal and uh, there isn't really anything they can do about it, right? Sucks. But uh, I have definitely learned a lot of lessons from the journey with it. You know, I have met some amazing people. Um, I've had the opportunity to, uh, you know, really take a, a deep dive in spirituality that I probably not uh, would have encountered otherwise, you know? Mm. Yeah. Uh, I've always been, you know, the kind of person who uh, likes to think about stuff, but, uh, you know, death and dying and what comes after that, I mean, who wants to think about that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's but, almost like your your dying has allowed you to become more alive in a way. It seems. Mm -hmm. It's a hundred percent like that. I mm. I absolutely have a greater appreciation for every moment. Mm. Um, now now that I have the anxiety out of the way, I can actually uh, enjoy uh, those moments much more than I was able to previously. Mm. You know where. Uh, with anxiety, I was more focused on, uh, you know, being aware of my heartbeat and breathing. Whereas mm -hmm. without anxiety, I'm, you know, enjoying how warm the day is and, you know, and yeah. the smell of the fresh air. Yeah, it just brings you closer to the moment. As well, cliche as it sounds, right? It, it does. I didn't think it would do that. I, I honestly didn't. Um, I, I know people talk about it and people kind of explain how their life has changed since they have had the experience. But until you actually experience it, it is um, difficult to appreciate how much more in tune with the moment you can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, meditate at all? Oh, a lot. Every day. Yeah, oh, and I think awesome. that's uh, one of the things that actually helped me when I was uh, um, starting to use the uh, the psychedelics for my session. Mm -hmm. So we did actually a, a stepped dosage. So uh, started about uh, eleven thirty in the morning and uh, took uh, two and a half grams. Mm -hmm. uh, waited uh, forty five minutes and uh, took another two and a half, and uh, waited another forty five minutes and took the final two. Mm -hmm. So. Um, in between those uh, dosages, I had headphones on, blindfold, and uh, meditating. Mm. So um, by being able to kind of go to the, the quiet place in meditation, I didn't really have uh, quite as a distressing experience with the onset of the psilocybin. So, mm. Yeah, there's a lot of power in meditation. Yeah, it was a good way to go for me anyways. Um, you know, I, of course, have never experienced anything like that. So uh, nothing like getting anxiety to deal with your anxiety, right? <laughs> Would you, or do you think there's ever a need for you to do it again? Or is it once and like, that's all you need to see? Well, you know, I, uh, I do not know how long the effects will last. I know a lot of people have a single dose and that's all they need, but um I guess the fact is, if I feel like I need another dose, I am not afraid to have another dose. Mm -hmm. And I'm very aware that, you know, taking another dose will very likely have the beneficial effects that I hope it will. Mm -hmm. Which is mitigating anxiety, essentially. 100%. Yeah. Mm. And, mm. Uh, you know, it, it seems to have that uh, deeper spiritual connection as something that happens to go along for the ride. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. mm. That's awesome, man. I, um, so can you get more into the actual experience of the, the therapy session, what you did? Sure. So with the uh, psilocybin assisted therapy, um, there are a number of sort of parts to how it goes. Uh, starts off, finding, you know, a connection with the therapist. So developing a rapport, um, your therapist is kind of going to be your anchor. So it has to be somebody that you feel uh, a good deal of trust and security with. That's mm -hmm. uh, number one. Um, we had a number of sessions in the days leading up to that where, you know, we, we kind of found out uh, my understanding of 
how psilocybin works and uh, you know, whether I would even be a candidate for it. If you've got some certain conditions like, uh, is it bipolarism or schizophrenia? Uh, any types of conditions where you have like a kind of a tenuous hold on reality, then probably <laughs> something reality altering isn't for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so once we figured out that uh, it was going to be safe for me to use that and that I had you know, realistic expectations and a reasonable understanding of what was going to happen. Um, we uh, set a date for it the day before that. There are a number of uh, kind of psychological tests that they do. So where do I score on the anxiety scale? Where do I score on the depression scale? On the, uh, oh, uh, uh, despondency, I think is the other one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for, for myself, I scored like a 36 on the anxiety scale. And I believe extreme anxiety is a 30. So, you know, oh. up there. Yeah, definitely. Um, it was a real surprise to me, to be honest. I, I really, I, I mean, it's like being in a room that you've painted, right? You know, mm -hmm. you, you paint the room, you smell it when you first do it, and, and then it sort of fades into the background and you don't notice it until you leave and come back. Mm. And, you know, the, the anxiety and depression for me were a lot like that. It was just like a constant level of volume that uh, was kind of turned up all the time. And just kind of got so, used to it. Kind of got used to it. Mm -hmm. So once we uh, filled those out, uh, kind of got a baseline for where we were at. Uh, the day of the uh, the uh, therapy session, we uh, set up uh, in my uh, guest bedroom here at the house. So, you know, someplace where it is a comfortable setting where you feel safe, secure, and, and all that good stuff. So some people like to go into nature. Some people, you know, uh, feel more comfortable near, you know, running water or something like that. This happens to be what I had handy and, uh, you know, not depending on the weather. So you did it at your house? I did. Yes. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. So I, uh, I had my therapist here and a, uh, a sitter who was a, a friend of mine who was uh, experienced with ayahuasca oh. and, uh, a, uh, crew from, uh, Therasil who were documenting it for me. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I had the whole experience uh, filmed. So we'd be able to uh, you know, use that for future reference. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I've seen some clips online of it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, once uh, I had taken my dose, you put the blindfold on, you put the earphones in. Um, at that point, on the outside, it starts to look really boring. Yeah. Um, it is a very introspective process. So yeah. you are on the inside, everything is happening there. Um, whatever, whatever you have to deal with again, gets uh, that iconized form and uh, you experience whatever it is you're going to experience. Mm -hmm. But the important part of that is to embrace the experience and to accept whatever is happening is exactly what needs to happen and be open to it you know mm. it's gonna be weird it's gonna be different but you know it's an experience just have it <laughs> yeah it's an experience just have it yeah it's uh i kind of described that uh so when you when you take psilocybin it's like uh one of those revolving doors going into a department store right you know mm -hmm. automatic door you take you take psilocybin it's like stepping into that door you know, either you are prepared to go with the flow and have the experience or the experience is going to hit you in the butt and you're going to have the experience anyway. Uh, it's mm -hmm. much better to be uh, accepting and embracing. So, you know, walk with it, push on the yeah. door, whatever you got to do. But that um, acceptance and courage is almost always rewarded with a good result out of the session. One hundred percent. Well, um, do they choose the music for you, or is it your own music? the uh, The first hour, hour and a half, I was listening to some of my own music, but I didn't really have much of uh, an onset of the psilocybin at that time. Mm. Um, I was just kind of using that for my meditation. Once the uh, psilocybin started to take effect, we switched over to the Johns Hopkins uh, psilocybin playlist. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get on you know, Spotify or or a number of other places. It's uh, readily available online. Yeah, um, I listen to it a little yeah. bit. It's a lot of classical music. Quite a bit of classical. Um, what I listened to also had uh, some uh, South American, some uh, African drummers, oh. a um, little bit of uh, shamanic chanting and throat singing. So mm. the the mix I had was an interesting blend to uh to say the least <laughs> <laughs> that's Produced awesome some uh some very interesting uh sites which I, I thought was kind of cool um i don't know whether uh, i had some of the visuals because i had preconceptions of the artwork of the cultures the music came from mm. or whether somebody in that culture had a similar experience to me and the artwork was a result of the music Mm, that's interesting yeah yeah so what were the visuals so did you like you were listening to like the shamanic um chants and then you saw like a lion or a tiger or something um no but uh say uh some of the uh, south american music that i was listening to Mm -hmm. i would associate that with something like a mayan or or aztec sort of yeah a a feel to the music and the space that that created uh, was a, a very rectangular space. The lower part of it was uh, these uh, sort of orange tubular shapes, which were very much like the types of shapes you see in uh, Aztec artwork. Oh, the, yeah. The top above that mm. was more like rainforest uh, bamboo. Mm. So it was a, almost like an interesting mix between something technological and something natural. Mm, that is interesting. Yeah. Technological and natural. Yeah. It was, it was kind of neat. Wow. And uh, you know, they were, they were perfectly, you know, connected together. So it's mm-hmm. like that um, makes me curious about, uh, you know, whether uh, again, that's a preconception on my part or whether that's a shared experience. I think my opinion is it's a shared experience. I don't, cause like, have you ever really seen, like, I don't know. I, I think, have you seen those shapes and really noted those? Like you might've seen those in passing, but mm-hmm. I think that it's not like an accident that when you go through that experience, everybody shares that. Like there are other people and I've seen it myself. There are other people that see these visualizations mm-hmm. and it's just like these shapes that are just like, evolving into each other and it's just you can see them and then they evolve into something else and very yeah. tribal very like it's i know it's like a machine i can't even explain it to be honest with you and i'm not the only one that has said something like that there's plenty of people especially like terence mckenna with the machine elves and mm-hmm. there's other like it has to be shared like there's just something inside of our subconscious and it might go back to like the Amazon civilization, like you said, when we were more in tune, but there's something that's imprinted into our DNA that enables yep. us to have these visuals for some reason. We do seem to have some sort of a shared story. Yeah, definitely. There is some kind of collective unconscious going on. I'm uh, kind of of the opinion that uh, uh, consciousness is something that uh, is kind of like an ant colony, right? You, uh, you have a bunch of ants, none of the ants really know what's going on, but as a colony, they do things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think all of the living things on the planet contribute to kind of a gestalt consciousness, yeah. which is the whole planet. And, and we are like a cell in that. Yeah. And they I, say I think, we're the guy in mind. You ever heard that? Yep, absolutely. I, yeah. I think that makes sense as a thing because we have other examples of that in nature where you know uh, the cells in your body have a purpose and they have all agreed to get together and be a you yeah but individually they have no idea who you are and you do not have any direct communication with any of them mm, yeah <clears throat> just like the the earth probably doesn't know who i am and i don't, I don't have any direct communication with the earth but the, or the guy in mind and but there's something that's pushing us in a certain direction like if you zoom out to humanity and look at us like an ant colony you will Mm -hmm. think that we are like in the hive mind like you would think that we are just like these things going to our job or going to do whatever we have to do and then we come home and we sleep and then we eat Mm -hmm. and there is something that's pushing us and propelling us through and 
through these actions. And yeah. I, yeah. I think the brain is kind of like an antenna and we're tuned into the, that, that mind through mm -hmm. our brain. And, um, yeah, it makes I you wonder that. if uh, something like uh, psilocybin or LSD or DMT adds that extra hook on the antenna that lets you see into the uh, rest of the transmission? I think it is, yeah. I think it's just like frequency. We get certain frequencies and it allows us to vibrate at a different frequency. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we take in the transmission of, you know, I guess you could say uh, universal love, unity, yeah. like what, like the truth. I don't know. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it is, a, it's a different kind of frequency that if I tried to do that right now, I can think about it, but I can't, I can't really, like, I can't vibe on that. Like there's not, mm -hmm. I can't change the dial right now if I wanted to, I'd have to meditate for like six hours or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, mm. exactly. That uh, sounds a little bit like some of the stuff that uh, you know Tom Campbell talks about. Uh, I'm not too familiar with his work. Tom Campbell is a, a retired NASA physicist who uh, has a, a trio of books called uh, My Big Toe or My Big Theory of Everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is a simulation theory person. Mm -hmm. So he believes that the uh, nature of our universe is that it is all consciousness everything and is conscious everything is a consciousness yep. so physical reality is just consciousness hmm. so um what we are experiencing uh, in his view is is kind of like a uh, world of warcraft so mm -hmm. you know we would be the the avatars in the game uh, and the actual consciousness controlling it is outside of that system so, so some may say that's god yeah, that, some would call it that. Um, or in, in his particular case, he believes that, you know, that's uh, something outside of our universe. I'm, my personal ideas on that, uh, you know, as a convenient word, I would say God isn't necessarily an entity in the universe. Probably closer to say uh, I would think God is the universe. Yes. So. Yes. And then some. And then some. Which and doesn't even like you can't even comprehend that. Yeah. Like all yeah. these people have ideas of God and it's just like, no, it's just like you can't even think about it. It's just like it's just everything. I know what you mean. A hundred percent. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Did you have these ideas before your psilocybin uh treatment? Yes. But since I've had my psilocybin treatment, my take on a lot of things is slightly different from mm. what it was. Um, I, I had been kind of leaning to the idea that, uh, you know, maybe uh, we as a species might be a stepping stone to, say, bootstrap artificial intelligence as mm. the, the actual next intelligence to I uh, that. populate the planet. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think maybe we are not necessarily complex enough creatures to be able to interact with a consciousness the size of a guy in type of mind. So, you know, it's possible that we might be something that is just bootstrapping that as, as a next step. Mm. But that doesn't mean that we don't have, you know, purpose in the universe. Of uh, course, yeah, we're the we're the arbiters of that next step. And which you is, know, isn't that beautiful? It, it's it's cool to be in a position where you can literally create your reality. Yeah. Yeah. That's which, you know, not a lot of people know that. And it, that that's thrown around a lot. Like you can do whatever you want in this life manifestation, but, <laughs> but it's, you know, uh, getting through the corny and cliche sayings like that. It's like, it's actually true. Like if you, you know, that's what we're here for. We're here to curate and cultivate our own lives to build yeah. a better world. No, you know, uh, I say this to people all the time. It, it doesn't matter, you know, whether, you're healthy or whether you got cancer like me, you've got, you know, X number of days to live, right? Yeah, exactly. And it is absolutely your choice whether you want those days to be filled with cool, fun stuff and happiness or, you know, whether you want to be miserable and think about negative things all the time. You know, for mm -hmm. me, I, I really, I have no use 
for negativity. I am probably the most positive person you know that I know because why would I want to be miserable for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. People don't know that it's just like a simple switch. Like you don't have to pay attention to the negativity. It's just, it's all what you want to, like we, like we talked about before, it's all perspective. It's all like what you want to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's all like, you, I like, I love the idea of the, the, what you said with the Titanic. It's <laughs> like, you know, it was horrible, but the, for the lobsters, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> It's, and that's true in terms of your life, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can think about things that are so everything, everybody's going through shit, man. I mean, I know that mm-hmm. you, you know, you have stage four cancer, which is like, that's, you know, I can't even imagine, but like, you know, at the end of the day, we're all first tenant of Buddhism is life is suffering. We're mm-hmm. all going to go through some kind of shit in our life. We're all eventually going to grow old and we're all eventually going to die. So it's just like, mm-hmm. you can either look at that from like, oh, wow, well, I only have a certain amount of time. I can live life to the fullest, or you can be like, "Oh, what was me? I'm, you know, what, this is just life is suffering. Oh, this sucks," and just go against it. Or you can, you know, getting back to the revolving door, you can either go against the door, mm-hmm. or you can, you can go with the door. It's a yeah. it's a it's a choice, and we you know we have to as human beings collectively come to that choice, and that's how we create the better world. Is just by our mindset. It starts right here. It starts up here. It does. It does. You know, you, you totally got a choice. You know, you're, you're driving in traffic behind somebody who's slow. I mean, you can get uptight about it, or you can think that, uh, you know, maybe that is my uh, dear old mother in that car. And, yeah. or, you know, maybe it's my uh, daughter and she's just learning how to drive and she's scared, you know? <laughs> it's a choice, man. We all have that choice. <sighs> it's, it's, it's a simple, just it'd be a good person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I have kind of uh, come to the conclusion that, you know, uh, I, I would like the world to be a certain way. And I am just living as if the world is that way. And, mm. uh, you know, I would like a world where people uh, care about each other and are concerned and compassionate and empathetic. And uh, so that is kind of the way that I try to uh, do my thing. And and uh, sharing the positivity with as many people as I can. Mm. And that's all we can do. Like, you know, there's only so much you can say to somebody. You can't do anything. You can honestly, like words really can't change somebody that much if you tell somebody to change. You can only change at an individual level. And and from there, others like see that or they, they feel your vibe and your energy of that positivity and they change. Like Ram Dass says, the best thing that I can do for you is to work on myself. And it's true. Like we, we can't judge, don't judge anybody else. You just judge yourself and work on yourself. And, you know, I think that positive mindset is something you, you curate. It's not something that like, it's not just a simple, like it is, it is a simple switch, but living in this crazy world of, you know, <laughs> whatever's going on right now, it's, it's not something that a lot of people can just come to. It takes like, you know, it might take a psychedelic experience or a lot <laughs> of meditation or just, you know, exercise taking care of yourself, changing your diet, but it's all of the work that we need to do at an individual level. And that is how we create that better world, man. Yeah. A hundred percent. hundred percent. Doesn't, uh, doesn't hurt to stop watching the news too. Yeah. Man. That is number one. <laughs> Step one, just don't watch the news, turn off your phone. That is, that is just toxic, man. We don't need that in our life. Like, no, the problem is, is that, you know, the, the, the media has gotten that way for a reason. I mean, people watch stuff that is you know train wrecks and car crashes yeah Yeah. Uh, if we put more emphasis on the news showing the positive good things that were happening in the world it would change things it would it would but it wouldn't sell and that's the problem (laughs) is the news is a business yeah, so we we it appeals to our emotions of fear and just you just clickbait and that's what sells and that's what makes money. It's simple, but yeah. if you put like good things, it's not gonna like. For some reason, we our brain just isn't wired to be attracted to the beautiful butterflies as much mm-hmm. in in the in the cats. Well, people like cats. I'm not gonna say not cats. People like cat videos, <laughs> <laughs> but like I don't. It just seems like a weird part of our psychology that's beyond my scope of understanding that we. 
we just like the car crash. You know, everyone watches NASCAR for the crashes. Everyone watches UFC to see people get knocked out. We just like the mm -hmm. drama. There's just yeah. something about that. So I don't know. Until we change our, our inner being and change our mind and what we want to see, it's the news isn't going to change. It's, a, it's just, you know, it's just going to sell us what's going to make money. Yeah. It's interesting that following my psilocybin experience, um, not only do I have a lot less of the clutter in my head in terms of, you know, the, the kind of thoughts that I used to have, you know, uh, the, the what ifs or would have, could have, that type of useless, busy stuff. Yeah. Um, so not only has that gone away, but it is a lot easier for me to just let go of all kinds of new experiences too that are negative. You know, so if I watch the news and I, uh, I see the, uh, you know, negative things happening on there, it is a lot easier for me to just let that go and not become caught up in it. Yeah, exactly. It's called, I call it, don't get lost in the sauce. Mm -hmm. the, the news is the sauce. You just don't get lost. The sauce is thick and it's easy to get, get sucked into, but. Yep. It's been, once you realize where it, you know what the sauce tastes like and what it's like, you don't want to you don't want to even go there. Your mind does not you, you just go look the other way. <laughs> you're like you're like Neo in the Matrix, you know. You're just like avoiding all of the negativity, and that's the problem with the world is we get sucked into that negativity, mm -hmm. and it's so easy. It's easy. It's easy to get like latched onto that and attach ourselves to that because it's everywhere and it's right here. The first the where it is, it's right here. It's in our pocket now. Oh, and yeah. it's a sickness. It's a sickness. <laughs> I don't know how we get over it. Maybe everybody just needs to take seven grams of psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not actually being yeah. serious. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend that for everybody, but... Uh... <laughs> not everybody, not everybody, but there's a good amount of people that it could help. And that's why I think mm -hmm. it's important to get your story out to anybody who wants to hear it because there's just a lot of people that one don't even know about it or two if they know about it they think magic mushrooms are just this like party drug or you're just gonna see yeah. elephants and you're just gonna like that you're just gonna get high mm -hmm. you know they don't know that there's therapeutic uses in this medicinal uses to what this is so yeah. i mean that's why i wanted to talk to you man because it's just it's so important it's it, it, it it's affected me it's affected a lot of people that i know a lot of people on the internet that I've talked to and I see how important it is. And to know that this is a, it's a schedule one substance that is pinned as like, you know, it's in the same category as, uh, I don't actually don't even know, know the it's exact worse. category. It's worse than heroin. It's heroin, crack, meth. It's yeah. like, like it's, it's an absurdity. I think yeah. I, and I'm standing by this. It's a crime against humanity that this substance, psilocybin and any other plant medicine is mm. being kept from the public. Like there's something not right and people will look back in the future and, and they'll probably look at you as the first guy. So congratulations <laughs> on that. And they'll look back in the future and be like, wow, like what was wrong with society? They made this the most beautiful, having, you can have one of the most beautiful experiences of your life. And it's mm -hmm. a schedule one. It's, it's, it's federally illegal everywhere in the world, yeah. well, except like Jamaica, I think. And there's a few other countries, but pretty there, much there are everywhere. a couple of countries that have completely decriminalized all drugs. Yeah. Like Portugal. Yeah. Uh, which I think is uh, a smart way to go. Honestly, you, yeah. know, you could take that money from, just like they've done, you know, you go out of uh, the the enforcement of petty people who are using for personal use, and you put that into social programs to make life better, so they don't need to use self medication. Yeah. You know, exactly, exactly. It's simple. I mean, we all know the war on drugs is an absolute complete failure. It, but, but the problem is we're we're still suffering from the repercussions of that. Like mm -hmm. we're still suffering from what the war on drugs is because we, all these old policies that were instituted in the, in the sixties and seventies and eighties, we're still like, we're still going through that. Like, mm -hmm. and we need to get, we need to just abolish those laws essentially or rework the laws, mm -hmm. but it's such a process, man. Like how do you convince the American public that's going through like so much right now or the Canadian public or any other mm -hmm. Western or anywhere in the world that this is it, it's not a dangerous thing. You're not going to die. You can't overdose. Um, mm -hmm. And people use it for transformative experiences. 
like it's such it, it seems like we have such a long way to go but yeah. i think you just getting it out there man i i think i've I've stressed this enough how important it is. You just saying, talking about your experience and seeing that you're a sane individual. You know, you are just this regular guy. Like you said, you're, what was the white bread analogy you said? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty plain white bread. Your are you're plain <laughs> as white bread. I, I don't think you are. I think you're very interesting. But, you know, if you do, there's other people out there that can be as plain as white bread. And if they, if they can relate to you and see that maybe, maybe I need that experience. Mm-hmm. It's, it's important it's 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 quite important because it can save lives like how many people i don't know the exact figure off the top of my head but how many people in the western world commit suicide from you know depression and just simply just can't go on like and how many people if they were administered seven grams of psilocybin wouldn't have made that choice Mm -hmm. probably a good amount like this can save lives and not only like actual physical lives it can save our mental lives it can literally make us have us live a greater life like uh, have us just be more happy of just being mm-hmm. a human being and, and let's say it doesn't even work for all of those people that you give it to right yeah what is the value of a human life i mean mm. even saving one human life by the use of you know this schedule one substance yeah isn't that worth it i, I mean yeah, if, it if, if it was somebody you loved wouldn't you want them to not commit suicide exactly it, it, even one is worth it man it's it's 100 percent. but but the thing is it's not one it could be thousands, thousands if not maybe millions there's a lot of people in the world and mm. the mental uh, health crisis right now is is huge so yeah th- there's a lot the, we don't know the exact number but there's a lot of people that could gain so Mm -hmm. much from not even just psilocybin anything just any of these plant medicines yeah and it's it's evil man i just i literally think it is evil that these things are still being kept from us yeah Uh, well you know i i think it was kind of the product of uh a lot of misinformation and that was more targeted at the social aspects i think at the time yeah, like the hippie um, movement. They didn't want like the deterioration of, you know, of our societal values. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, people don't really want to go off to another country and shoot people once you've had this universal love experience. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, was, it wasn't really good for what they were trying to do. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you put aside the political stuff and if we can just focus on the real healing that's happening and uh, benefiting people instead of trying to stick to these outdated political agendas, Mm. then we can really make something worthwhile out of this. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we create a better world. I really do think so. Like we create a better world. Mm. Um, After my experience, I feel, you know, a lot more empathetic. I feel more in connection with my emotions uh, in, in ways that I don't get, you know, overwhelmed by them. I, I can see them and feel them and, and all of these things. But, uh, you know, uh, even when I'm having, uh, you know, a bad day or whatever, it's not so bad. Mm. If everybody was able to have this increase in empathy and connection to other people. I mean, I don't really see how that could be harmful to society, you know? Mm-mm. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, you know, it yes. seems like connectedness to your fellow man and stuff like that doesn't seem like a bad idea. Yeah, exactly, man. When you put it like that, it's just, it's so simple. Like we just need to all come together. And realize that we're all the same thing. We're all going through this struggle, mm-hmm. and that's not the that's not the current vibe that the world is on right now. It's just it's very, it's just polarity. It seems like mm-hmm. everybody's at each other's neck, and yeah. it's that's not that's not going to work. That's just simply not. That's just not going to fly. <laughs> no, we, just, we can't. Like we just can't. It's either like we we realize that we're all in this together. And, you know, there is, a, there is a universal unity in between all of us. We're all human beings. We're all the same consciousness experiencing itself in a mm-hmm. subjective, infinite amount of ways. Or we keep going at the same path and we 
divide and divide we, we divide and you know we just keep mm-hmm. killing ourselves and the world's not going to work it's it's really that it's like one or the other like there's no middle ground <laughs> no <laughs> it's, it's literally like that yeah <laughs> oh, I, I don't know i don't know it's tough i mean there's there's a lot that's wrong with the world but i mean we literally have all the tools that we need to fix it yeah and we we have large areas of the world that are you know turning into desert and mm. yet we have knowledgeable people who know about sustainable agriculture methods that can actually reverse desertification mm. so you know we've got uh parts of the planet that we're losing because of our neglect but we have the ability to fix it yeah why aren't we fixing it we have people who are homeless we have people who you know are are displaced from natural disasters and things like that and we've got these areas of land that aren't being used for anything and could maybe use some people to fix them up yeah why why aren't we you know providing resources and things to people who could reverse the desertification produce more food crops have living space for people and by the way we're also sequestering carbon so we're helping with that whole greenhouse thing yeah Uh, all of this already exists i mean if i can find it on the internet i mean it's (laughs) yeah somebody somewhere who has uh you know the ability to to influence more people than me has to know about stuff like this exactly it's just our the the people with the power to make those decisions for the most part um aren't making those decisions their priorities are in the wrong uh place they just want to it's greed and Mm -hmm. money making and there's no unity there is no none of that like you know empathy in the people with all this power and 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 it it is truly we have all the tools we have an abundance to to make these Mm -hmm. changes and I don't know. How do we get those people with power? Because the, it, it seems weird. Like the most people that have power, it seems like that they they have a certain personality trait that enables them to, it's like a competition and to get to mm-hmm. the top and be the best. And to be the best, you don't exactly recognize that other people are, you know, you don't cooperate with people. You just had a competitive nature to be the best. And from yeah. there, you get a position of power and then you don't, people don't really necessarily change. Mm-hmm. So it's tough. Like the, it's, it's tough for to make those decisions and to, to, to actually institute policies that enable us to, to create that greener, better world. Mm-hmm. I think we've kind of, uh, you know, done a bit of this to ourselves with uh, uh, corporations. Yeah. So the, uh, the nature of uh, a corporation is, uh, well, I, I would liken it very close to uh, the nature of cancer. Mm. So uh, in the following ways, so uh, a corporation has all of the rights of a person, but they are immortal, Hmm. just like cancer cells are immortal. Mm. Um, A corporation uh, will reach a certain size at which point they begin consuming resources for the sake of consuming resources, uh, which allows them to pay shareholders dividends. Uh, So it is it is necessary to consume resources and grow Yes. in the same way that a cancer consumes resources and grows Mm. regardless of the health of the host, which is supporting it. Mm. So uh, (laughs) there's, there's this number of things where uh, corporations in my opinion have kind of developed uh, like a cancer on society, which, Mm. uh, you know, it makes me makes me think that perhaps that might not be a bad place for us to start looking for ways that we can kind of fix things. Yeah. Because yeah. as long as corporations are immortal, there isn't any stopping their growth and consumption. Mm. Just it is the way they're designed. They can't be any other way. Yeah. Wow, that's that is a very interesting take on it, and it's just yeah. like co- corporations are cancer. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of a fact. Yeah, um, you know, re- regardless of their intent, they all do that. Yeah, just <laughs> sucking resources and killing the host. Yeah, to to better its growth. Well, I mean, you know, take a look at uh, say Nestle for example, right? Mm-hmm. Nestle uh, has stated publicly that they don't think water is a right of 
people. Wow. Why'd they say that? What's the, what's the basis on that? Nestle is buying aquifers and oh. uh, they bottle the water and they sell it. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So they yeah. want to just capitalize on the water. So it's not a right. Yes. Wow. So if you want water, you have to pay for it. It's not your right to have water. Wow. Okay. There, there's a number of examples like that where, you know, corporations, they just do things like that. They believe mm. it's okay to, you know, dump garbage into the ocean because it's profitable. Mm. Mm-hmm. But a corporation uh, has no actual life. So it doesn't matter what a corporation does. So, yeah. you know, I, I think we would probably be smart if we put an expiry date onto corporations, say. Hmm. So, you know, when you, uh, when you incorporate uh, a new corporation, uh, you get a sealed envelope and within that envelope is the lifespan of your corporation. <laughs> you don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So at, uh, at the uh, expiry date in that envelope, you, uh, your corporation uh, dies, essentially. Mm-hmm. Maybe uh, you break it up into some children companies that get a portion of the money from the parent company and all of the intellectual uh, knowledge of it. But uh, new management teams would be able to bid on running those companies. Mm, that's Nobody an interesting from the original. idea. Yeah. yeah. So the, the original parent dies. It has children who have all of the knowledge of the parent, but now all of the kids are in competition. Mm. interesting so, idea i've never really heard a take on it like that and it, yeah that's that makes a lot of sense i mean it just comes down to limiting the power of the corporations it, whatever it is whether it's doing what you said it's just <laughs> they have some like amazon of number one just has yeah. way 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 too much power jeff bezos is taking over the world like yeah. it's insanity like how that. much money this guy has yeah. and how much power and influence this guy has it's more absolute, than countries. <laughs> more than, yeah, a lot of countries. It's craziness. It's absolute craziness. And mm-hmm. how, how long is he going to go uncapped? Is he, he might take over the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I, I 100% agree with you. Um, yeah, it, but I mean, if you have a corporation, what if, what if the corporation is, has good intentions, though? <laughs> yeah, like Tesla, for example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, they, I think he has good intentions. I don't think Elon Musk is an evil person. I think he's mm-hmm. one of the good guys. One of the, uh, one of the few really rich people like that who seems to be um, very specifically looking for things that we need to do as a species. Mm. You know, uh, yeah. he, he does a lot of the stuff. I, you know, I mean, obviously he makes money doing it, but I, I certainly don't begrudge him um, spending money that will actually make life on the planet better. Yeah. It's, it's more than just collecting a percentage off of every transaction when somebody goes shopping. Yeah, you know, exactly. He, he's building battery systems that can store energy to, you know, help us get away from fossil fuels. I think that sort of stuff really needs to be supported. Yeah, 100%. And he's trying to go to Mars. Yeah. And trying to hook us up to computers in our brain like it's i don't know who this guy is elon musk is from he, he's from another world but he's doing good i think he is definitely one of the good guys no you know he's doing he's thought of things that need to be done and he's just doing it yeah. if if more people did that you know we would be much farther ahead than we are yeah. everybody kind of assumes that they can't do anything right mm. um it, it's like uh Saw a meme the other day, says uh, everybody is always afraid of time traveling because they fear that doing something small will change the future. And yet everybody in today doesn't think that anything they do will have any impact on the future at all. (laughs) Yeah, because we are essentially, we are time traveling. Yeah, well, you know, the fact is that I needed to have psilocybin. I did something about it. Mm. I am no different from anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 100%. 100%, man. And it's all about the power that we have. People don't know that we have so much power and everybody, we all have so much power to change ourselves and change our world. And it takes, it's just small steps. 
You know, we're not gonna, you're not gonna change overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. Nope. And nobody's life is built in a day. You, you have, we all have to take the small steps to curate a, just a better understanding of who we are. And then from there, from that basis, we take the actions to create the life that we want, the life that we dream. Yep. And have some fun too. <laughs> yep. It's, I really think it's just as simple as living the life that you want to live. You know, literally yeah. just do that. Mm-hmm. And don't hurt anybody though. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's that. <laughs> yeah. Don't, you know, if the life you want to live is being a maniac serial killer, please don't do that. Perhaps reconsider. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you know, honestly, uh, if you, yeah, everybody always says, you know, follow your dreams and stuff like that. But you know, the, the fact is you literally have the potential to do and, and be as, you know, successful as you want to be at, you want yeah. to learn how to do stuff, just go do it. Yeah, we have the internet. Yep. Like, you can do it. <laughs> so what do you want to do? What do you want to get out of life now? Like, what is, where, where are you going after this? Are you just trying to enjoy it for the most that you can? Or are you trying to make a difference? <laughs> like, what, well, what, what's next short, for you? Uh, short-term goals for me, uh, you know, really just getting through the day and, uh, and kind of getting my life to what I would consider kind of a normal state. Uh, you know, I have been kind of uh, under anxiety and stuff for, for so long now that I'm kind of stepping back and breathing a little bit. Mm-hmm. Once I catch my wind, I really would like to uh, promote this uh, as a therapeutic option for people mm-hmm. because I have personally had, you know, what I would consider very profoundly good uh, effects from this therapy. And, you know, if, if you got half of what I got out of it, it is more than anything I have gotten from any other line of treatment that I've had. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Timothy Leary said he learned more on his first ever psilocybin experience. He learned more in the few hours that he was he was on the substance than his entire years of schooling going to harvard and you know his he was a he was a doctor mm-hmm. so yeah i 100 percent agree with that man it is it, it is a it is a quick way to learn and is a quick way to to change if that's what you want if that's what your intention is that's but, an yeah. important part of it yeah you you actually have to want to have change like you know it's kind of the difference between people who have been taking it recreationally and and people who are taking it therapeutically right mm. uh, it's it's that intention to change and the intention to address particular things because i i understand if people just take it recreationally you know like you say they're gonna see you know weird colors and shapes and you know maybe yeah. they'll find stuff funny or, or whatever yeah, yeah recreational uses like i don't know personally yeah but uh having the intention there seems to change the experience for people. Mm, I agree. Set and setting a hundred percent. It's all how we use it. I see the substance as a tool. It's, mm-hmm. it's a tool and you can use, it's just like a hammer. You can use yep. a hammer the wrong way and you can hurt yourself or mm-hmm. just, you know, you can have some fun with the hammer too. But like if you use a hammer the right way, you can build a house and the same thing with psilocybin, you can, you can use it the wrong way, which, Unfortunately, a lot of people do. I mean, I'm not one to judge. You can use it however you want to use it, as long as you're not hurting anybody. But Or you can use it in the way that you used it and really get something out of it and really have the potential to change your life and change the life of people around you, too, from the experience. Yeah. Yeah. For for me, like, I'm obviously, I'm a very big advocate of the uh, the therapeutic use of it. Um, you know, having had the experience, I would have to say that um, it would have to be described as a spiritual experience for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is completely within the wheelhouse of, you know, spirituality for me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I recognize that this is, you know, a psychotherapy and, and a psychological benefit, but the experience itself for me um, felt like it more fit into a spiritual category. 
were you before the experience? Like, did you have any kind of spiritualism? Well, I, I've always kind of considered myself spiritual, not religious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, none of the, the mainstream religions really fit my view of the universe. Yeah. But uh, most certainly believe in, uh, you know, the higher power and, and, you know, we're not alone and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, reincarnation, life after death, things like that have always been kind of um, intellectual things that I believed in. Yeah. But when you have an experience like the psychedelic therapy, it changes from an intellectual appreciation to more of a being level understanding. I know 100% what you mean. Yeah, 100%. I went through that experience myself. I took, this was actually a few years ago. I took like a heroic dose and I was, uh, I was like a pretty staunch atheist, to be honest with you. I was one of the guys that would like, Mm -hmm. just just like our rationale one plus one equals two um then i started to get into meditation and i started mm -hmm. to like feel a little more spiritual and but then i took psilocybin and i was like oh i understand now i i get it like there was something like i don't believe in the god with the puppet strings and he's, he's you know with the beard it's not mm -hmm. like that it's like this feeling that i got was the force that i understood to be god or what some other people would interpret as yep. that god and i got it and like i i that experience has never left me mm -hmm. and i'm still rational like i still have the logic and the rationale mind and the you know i try to see how yeah. things are plain black and white but you but know what it feels like <laughs> exactly i know that i had that mystical experience so from there once you open the door you can close it, but you know, like it's, it's open a little bit. <laughs> you can kind of see through it a little. Still there. Exactly, man. It's, yeah. it's, it, and that's, that's, it's a very powerful thing. It's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. kind of like a sense of comfort, you know, it's a, it's a sense of knowing, like if I was in that state at all times, uh, I don't think I would be able to, I wouldn't want to be in that state to be honest with you. It wouldn't be fun, but it's good to just go to that state and know the truth. Uh, and then come back and then live accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, <clears throat> I, I understand that if you, you know, go from the straight up scientific point of view, how, you know, it shuts down those areas of the brain and, and how, you know, the, the stuff happens. But, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't feel like it is a chemical experience. It feels like your reality yeah it's a mystical experience that is it's true it's truer than true real than real mm -hmm. yeah yep. mm. and definitely healing definitely healing it's a little scary but it's comforting that after the end of it like it's like in the in the bhagavad gita um krishna is talking to arjuna and i don't i'm not going to try to parrot i'm not going to try to quote it i'm not that good but there's a part <laughs> where, he, where he opens up and he's, you know, he opens up and shows Arjuna the entire universe. And, and, and because Arjuna really wants to know, he says, oh, please. He's like, tell me, show me, Krishna, what, what, is, what is the truth of the universe? I really want to know. Because at, in the Bhagavad Gita, up until that point, he was mm -hmm. showing him only the good things of, mm -hmm. of the world. And, and at that point, he opened up and showed him everything. And, and I think that's the same passage where um, he says, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. Mm -hmm. And he opens up and shows him the entire universe the good and the bad and, and everything. And then he comes back in and Arjuna realizes what it's like and that, that, that uh, like what, what it's like to be connected to the, the, the unity of, of all things and what, what Krishna really is, what God really is. And I kind of, I kind of relate that to the experience of the psychedelic experience. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. like, it kind of opens your mind up to all things. Like it's not all, you know, it's not all peaches and roses when you're on a psychedelic. It is, no. th there's points to that, but there's, it shows you everything, the scary parts, the, 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 just the, the enormity and the, the massiveness of mm -hmm. what exactly is going on. And we need that. I think it's, it's much needed. It's because it just something like our brain is just disconnected from that and makes us, um, I don't know, just fearful and just very, just at a low vibration. And just like, we don't get to see that when you see the enormity of the universe and your part in it, in this crazy cosmic, whatever is going on, 
it just it 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 like gives you a little more humanity. It kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? It, like like it it it, sh it I don't know what I'm trying to say. It, like it makes you more just like in tune with like who you are, mm -hmm. and just allows you to be happier because you realize that there's all this, and I'm just here. So I'm just gonna be me the best that I can be, being a human being in this crazy cosmic conundrum that we find ourselves in and it's mm -hmm. very humbling it's a humbling experience it's okay to be scared i think you have to, i think we have to like it's okay to face your fears oh but yeah it's as, important as, to <laughs> as jack nicholson says you can't handle the truth and that's that's true a lot of people just can't handle the truth but we have to that's face a fact it. yeah <laughs> we just have to face it man we like that's we just have to face it whether we like it or not i, I think kind of in life as with the uh psilocybin experience your bravery is almost always rewarded yeah 100 percent yeah 100 percent i mean we are we are supposed to face our fears and grow from that you know yeah. anything from the uh the cute girl that you uh want to go say hi to to uh you know skydiving and surgery you know? yeah exactly that's how we grow and um you know, it just comes down to this, man. We got two choices in life. It's fear or love. And yep. if you choose, it's not love as in, you know, like kissing and hugging. It's, it's love as in like loving your experience, loving your life, loving the choices that you make for yourself. You know, that's, that's love. It's fully being like self-love. Or you can fear and fear your choices and fear is only going to hold you back because you don't, you, you're just, uh, you're, you're creating these weird things in your head that are just obstacles and just like showing, it just, it's minimizing the possibilities. But if mm -hmm. you just fully engulf and love that, love the, like, love the anxiety that comes with it, mm -hmm. then, we, then we grow. Yeah. It's that simple. Yep. Life is a, a lot like a, a great big giant buffet, right? There's an infinite number of things that you can experience at the buffet. Mm -hmm. And your fear is what keeps your plate empty. Yeah. Wow, that's a great analogy. Yeah, if you if you don't want if you don't want to eat the, the crab rangoons or the you know you're yeah. afraid of the 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 chicken Over, fingers overcoming or your fear is like saying yeah I'll try some of that at the buffet of life you know <laughs> the buffet of life I love that man that's awesome what's all just um what's all just what's feast in the buffet of life I think I think that's what we all need to do just it's okay. And it's okay if you take some food and you don't like it. It's okay. At least, it's, at least you tried it at the buffet of life. <laughs> that's awesome, man. I think that's a perfect uh, point to, to end this thing, wrap this thing up. Um, Thomas, Tom, I don't know what you want me to call you, but Thomas Hartle, thank you. You are a legend. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on. This was an honor. I think we had an amazing conversation. Uh, Anytime, I'm, I'm, yeah. What'd you say? Anytime? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Hey, you're always welcome to come back on, man. This was, this was great. Uh, but yeah, this just keep fighting the good fight, man. Uh, whatever you can do, if you got other people ask you, please just get, get the word out because it's so important for people like you that are level headed, that aren't crazy long haired hippies with dreadlocks and nose piercings. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I love hippies. I love those people. <laughs> those, those are my people. But I'm just saying people aren't going to listen to the hippies. People are going to listen to the people that are level-headed and as plain as white bread like you or like that, um, like Dr. James Cook that I had on. So mm -hmm. keep fighting the good fight. Keep doing your thing. And let's, let's keep feasting at the buffet of life. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It was great. <laughs>